The Legend of Jimmy Spoon by Christiana Gregory, Chapter 27, Jimmy's Second Winter. Snow covered the mountain peaks. Now that Jimmy was well, Mashaki was in a hurry to move on to their winter home. While Hanabi, Old Mother, and the other women began packing for the trip, Hoshaki opened the flap of a smaller teepee and nodded for Jimmy to enter. Here, Dawi, for you. Jimmy unfolded a parfletch. Inside were several metal fish hooks, a new bridle, two pairs of underwear, a pouch full of peppermint drops, an auger, and a knife of shiny steel with a stout leather handle. Hoshaki had sold two of his horses and swapped the Bajono robes for metal pots and frying pans and 24 red blankets, which Jimmy knew would please the others because they love bright colors. There was also red flannel to use for the tongues of moccasins, and many small bags of beads, all sizes and colors, traded for Old Mother's tanned buckskins. A brass bucket with a shiny new handle was the prized item. This the chief gave to his mother. When Jimmy saw the thick squares of calico, he pictured his mother, his mother's dresses and felt a wave of sadness, but he quickly dismissed the feeling and instead wondered why Indians wanted to sew clothes from white people's cloth. Skins were so much more comfortable and soft, and in winter there was nothing warmer. When the sun was overhead, Washaki's band passed Fort Hall and again forded the Paiupa. Now shallow and not as treacherous, several days later they crossed the Continental Divide. At the headwaters of Angatipa, hunters enjoyed the last buffalo hunt until spring, killing 16, two for each teepee. They continued west into a low mountain range, with snow up to Jimmy's waist. Here, after trampling the drifts flat enough for their tents, the families camped under a full moon. Because the ground was too frozen to drive stakes, the teepee covers were wrapped lower around the poles, allowing the hems to be weighted with rocks. Jimmy helped Napangamu tether the horses to the trees to keep them from wandering off in search of grass. After another day of cold, slow traveling, the Shoshone descended to a dry valley by nightfall, and by nightfall, were alongside a beautiful branch of the Paiupa that shimmered under the moonlight. The next day, Washaki led them to where the stream met a large river that one day would be named the Columbia. Washaki Shoshone had finally reached their winter home. The snow was heavy, but they were sheltered from the wind. The river was layered with thick ice, enough for the children to play on. Jimmy marveled at the fish he could see below. The ice was as clear as if he were watching through a glass window. Mountain trout swam slowly back and forth, and crayfish crept over rocks along the bottom. An otter scurried after the trout, nosing them playfully, then darting off in another direction. It apparently was not hungry. Every few minutes it surfaced to break under the beaver dam or a hole in the ice. It was slender with webbed hind feet, and Jimmy noticed with admiration its coat was the color of dark chocolate. It would make a good, a good skin for a new quiver, don't you think? He asked Nampa. They waited quietly, watching through the ice. The otter was busy chasing a fish, oblivious to the boy's shadows. Jimmy held a rock over his head. The otter ex exhaled, a huge silvery bubble of air that was in its lungs. Now, Nampa said, Jimmy heaved the rock through the ice, startling the otter. It hurried away, but Jimmy knew it hadn't time to take another breath. It swam slower and slower. Jimmy and Nampa slipped along the ice following it. The otter's final breath had filled its lungs with water. It gave a few frantic kicks, then sank to the sandy bottom. Nampa pulled his axe from his belt to chop a hole in the ice. Jimmy scooped the dead animal out with a forked branch, then took it to camp. He skinned it and stretched its fur, and stretched the fur to dry. It was more than four feet long. Old Mother skewered the meat over the fire. A few days later, she began embroidering the skin with rows of dyed porcupine quills and colored beads. When she sewed it together, Jimmy had the most elegant quiver in camp. And that's the end of chapter 27.